Welcome back to our learning course. In this lesson, we will see how studying classical conditioning has been useful to understand and manage some side effects of cancer treatment. The side effect we will be talking about is loss of appetite and weight loss resulting from it. Many cancer patients lose their appetite during treatment and as a consequence, they lose weight. They report that the foods that they once liked have become disgusting. This is a problem for the patient's quality of life and also for the outcome of the treatment because the appetite loss can be significant enough to weaken the patient. The link between appetite loss and Pavlovian conditioning was established by Aileen Bernstein in a series of studies starting in the late 1970s. The source for this lesson is a review article published by Bernstein in 1985. There are at least three possible causes of appetite loss in cancer patients. First, the cancer itself could make the patient unwell and unwilling to eat. Second, the drugs we give could make the patient sick. Both of these things can happen. But here we are interested in a third potential cause of appetite loss, Pavlovian condition. At first, it's hard to see how Pavlovian conditioning and cancer treatment could be linked, and understanding this link was a great insight of Bernstein. Bernstein knew that many cancer drugs are actually poison. They are used because they are more poisonous to cancer cells than to healthy cells, but they also affect healthy cells. As a consequence, a common side effect of some cancer drugs is to make the patient sick, in a similar way to food poisoning. This is the body recognizing the poison and trying to get rid of it, for example through nausea, vomiting and diarrhea. This was common knowledge, but Bernstein's insight was to make the connection between poisons in real life and poisons in the psychology laboratory. As we know from the lesson on Pavlovian preparations, we sometimes give animals a bellyache to see how they learn to avoid tastes and flavors that may be associated with the bellyache. We saw this technique also in other lessons, for example, the lesson Do Animals Imagine the Future? Bernstein realized that the conditioning trial in taste aversion learning is essentially identical to giving a patient a drug that induces nausea and vomiting. The parallels are illustrated here on the slides. In taste aversion learning, we let the animal eat something and then give a mild poison. Similarly, the cancer patient could eat something before going to the hospital for treatment, then receive the drug and get sick. Throughout these lessons, the drugs are indicated by the prescription sign. This is to distinguish them from generic poisons. We mentioned in the lesson on overshadowing that animals associate sickness very easily with flavors, but much less so with other stimuli. So Bernstein reasoned that the patient's brain could be unconsciously attributing the sickness to whatever it ate last, rather than to the treatment. The logical conclusion of this hypothesis is that patients would develop taste aversions to the foods in their own diet, which would turn them from yummy to yucky, and so they would eat less and less as the treatment goes on. The first test of this hypothesis was the so-called Mapletoff experiment, which was conducted with child patients. The experiment has three groups of subjects. The experimental group ate ice cream right before a drug treatment. The ice cream flavor was made up by Bernstein mixing two existing flavors, maple syrup and toffee, which she named Mapletoff. She did this because she wanted to be sure that the children had never tasted that flavor before and also because studies with rats suggested that aversion is conditioned more easily to new flavors. At a later appointment, which is indicated in the table as the test phase, the children were given the option of having some more maple toff or playing a game. If Bernstein's hypothesis was correct, the patients should have developed a distaste for the ice cream and refused it. But we cannot draw this conclusion from the experimental group alone, because there are two possible confounds. First, the drugs could have caused the aversion directly, rather than eating the ice cream before getting sick, as was Bernstein's hypothesis. To control for this possibility, Bernstein introduced the drug control group, the second line in our table, which received only the drug, but no ice cream. The second potential problem is that the new maple top flavor could have been bad, so that the children could have just refused to eat it, not because they were sick or they didn't like it, but just because it was a bad flavor. So Bernstein introduced a taste control group, the third line in our table, made of children that ate maple top, but were not taking drugs at the time or were in treatment with drugs that do not mimic food poisoning. 
The question is now how much ice cream at the test did the children in each group eat? These are the results. Only about 20% of children in the experimental group choose to have maple toff again, while this number was much higher in the control groups. Bernstein could conclude from this data that having maple toff just before getting sick is really what drives the aversion to maple toff. Getting sick alone is not enough, and having the ice cream alone is also not enough. It is interesting to note that the aversion to maple toff developed even after one single trial with a long ISI, that is a long interval between tasting the ice cream and the onset of sickness, which can take hours. We know that this is typical of taste aversion learning from our lessons on Pavlovian preparation. What may be less obvious is that the aversion developed even in children that were old enough to understand that it was the drug to make them sick and not the ice cream. We'll talk about this point at the end of the lesson. A skeptic could now say, OK, but the Mapletoff study only tells us that taste aversion learning can work on something highly unusual and new, this weird Mapletoff flavor that was tasted only before getting sick. But can a taste aversion learning work for pancakes, mac and cheese, eggs and bacon, and all of the food that people normally eat before going to the hospital for treatment? To test this, Bernstein ran first an experiment with rats. The crucial difference between this experiment and the usual taste aversion experiments is that the rats were not given a highly distinctive and novel food before being poisoned. The rats were on a regular rat diet, here symbolized by our usual pizza slice, and received poison injections once in a while. For added realism, the poison was an actual cancer drug. After receiving the drug a few times, the rats were given a choice between the regular food and the new one here symbolized by a hamburger. How much would they eat of each, was the question. Let's look at the first two groups of the experiment, which are in the top part of the table, the experimental group and the control group. The experimental group was treated as I just explained, pizza and poison. The control group were not made sick at all, they just ate the pizza diet. This is similar to the taste control group in the Mapletov experiment. It is needed to see what rats do normally when given the choice between the two foods, pizza and hamburger. The result was that the experimental group preferred to switch to the new food when given the choice, while the control animals were indifferent. So the experimental group had developed an aversion to its usual diet, which supports the hypothesis that the same could happen with human patients during cancer treatment. Adding more experimental groups to the experiment, Bernstein explored ways in which the aversion could be prevented. Some rats were not given any food for six hours before the drug. This is the no pizza group in the table. Some rats were given a drink with a new flavor, that's the line with a drop, before taking the drug, and some rats combined these two treatments. Lastly, some rats were given the food that would be used during the choice test. The result from this group was that only the last one, which ate a new solid food before getting sick, did not develop the aversion to the regular diet. All of the others develop as strong an aversion as the experimental group. So neither fasting nor the new drink protected the usual diet from being the target of the aversion. It was later discovered that aversions conditioned most easily to food containing proteins, which explains why the drink did not work. So all results up to now point in the direction that cancer drugs could condition aversions to people's usual diets. But you can still be a skeptic and say, OK, but these experiments was in rats. We don't know that the same things happen to humans. At this point, Bernstein realized that she had unwittingly ran the experiment on humans also. In her efforts to understand food aversions, she had asked the children and their parents to keep food diaries. Some of the children were later part of the Mapletop experiment, so she had food diaries from three groups of children, some who had eaten Mapletop before getting a sickness-inducing drug, some who had taken the drug without eating Mapletop, and some who had not taken any sickness-inducing drugs. These three groups are summarized in the table. With this data, Bernstein could check which children had developed taste aversions, not to the ice cream, which was the topic of the initial Mapletop study, but rather to foods in their usual diet. And the results were that the children who had eaten Mapletop before getting sick developed fewer aversions than those who didn't. 
that is, being in the experimental group of the Mapleton study seemed to have a protective effect on the children's diet. The control group is telling us how many children change tastes on their own, which is quite a few, about 30%, and it's important to know as a baseline for the other two groups. But the important result is that the experimental group, drug plus ice cream, developed fewer aversions than the drug alone group. And recall that these are aversions to the usual diet, not aversions to the ice cream in the Mapletoff study. Let's summarize what we have learned. Perhaps surprisingly, the fact that the side effects of many drugs mimic food poisoning means that treatment with these drugs can cause food aversions in humans. These aversions can develop after taking the drug only once, but they are more probable when taking the drug more than once, as in a continued treatment. The aversions can develop to foods in one's usual diet, but the preferred target of these aversions are new foods, like maple top ice cream. This makes sense if we think that the biological function of taste aversion learning is to protect animals from bad food. Something that you have eaten many times without ill consequence is less likely to be bad than something you eat for the first time. If you want, you can consider this a case of overshadowing of old food by new food. This last finding suggested to Bernstein the idea of using scapegoat foods, that is a food that is distinctively flavored but not essential, like candy. This food could be given to the patient before the sickness-inducing drug to protect the patient's diet from condition aversions. This idea has been tried with some success. Lastly, I want to stress that in these and other cases of unconscious learning, it does not matter whether we know or not the real cause of the aversion. We can explain a hundred times to cancer patients that it's the drug that makes them sick, and not the pancakes or whatever they ate for breakfast. The part of the brain that learns taste aversions is very ancient and does not understand language. It reasons more or less like a rat. It's what I like to call the brain you cannot talk to. This lesson is over. Here are some suggestions on what to study next. Happy learning to everyone!